excited like they got the Holy Ghost talking to Tommy and Brandon. And Bill Wilson's going to be sitting on like behind that. So I'm doing it's like a good talk. Krista. Hi. Welcome <laughs> to today's colloquium. Um, next week's colloquium will be delivered by Lakita Bonnet Bailey. Um, she'll be speaking on Pulse of the People, Political Rap Music, and Black Politics. And today, please do join us for the last of a three part um, lecture series delivered by Michael Gomez entitled West Africa in the Age of Ascent. Now, please welcome to the podium Jennifer Hochschild. She's Professor of Government of African African American Studies and Harvard Professor, Harvard College Professor. I also claim a toehold in the Kennedy School, so I'm especially delighted uh, for lots of reasons to introduce uh, Leah Wright Rigueur. Um, she is an assistant professor in the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, she has taught at Wesleyan University, got her PhD at Princeton. Um, she's the author of lots and lots of things, but in particular a book entitled, which I'm gonna get right, um, The Loneliness of the Black Republican, uh, Pragmatic Politics and the Pursuit of Power is uh, Princeton University Press in 2015. Uh, this is mostly a focus on Ed Brooke, um, Senator uh, Brooke from Massachusetts, but of course, as one would expect from Leah, it opens up wide vistas of all kinds of things having to do with politics, history, uh, political science, African, African American studies, and a bunch of other things. Um, she is, uh, more broadly, she has a lot of research interests. Uh, they range from 20th century African American history and politics, uh, 20th century United States more broadly or more narrowly, depending on how you think of it, uh, political and social history, uh, race politics, public policy, political ideology, political institutions, civil rights, social movements, the American presidency, uh, historiography, and she could probably add more things to that list, but that's a long enough list today. Uh, today she's going to talk to us about mourning in America, pond of course on the word mourning, um, and it's got two subtitles and two different um, pieces of paper that I have in front of me, so I'm gonna give you both of them because I think they kind of suggest the range of things. I'm not sure which, if either of them, is the final subtitle. Um, one, the, one subtitle is Black Men in a White House. Uh, the other is um, Ronald Reagan, Samuel R. Pierce, and the Crisis of the Modern Black Professional. So between the two of them, you kind of get a feel for what she's doing. Uh, she's focusing on the housing and urban development corruption scandal of the 1980s. You might think, oh, who actually cares very much about the HUD corruption scandal of the 1980s? Uh, well, she's going to tell us why we should care a lot about it. Uh, starting little note to just pique your interest if you needed it is that it's talking about roughly $8 billion of uh, federal funding that should have gone to low-income housing and went somewhere else to, to <laughs> particular individuals. Anyway, didn't go where it was supposed to go. Um, so she's using this case um, as a heuristic lens for exploring socially, politically, substantive issues of race, class, uh, politics in the 1980s. Uh, she is drowning in documentary evidence, as historians either like or maybe fear doing. Uh, she just told me that she just finished a FOIA request from the FBI, which at least in principle promises 8,000 documents, and that's some small subset of the kind of the array of material, of which we're going to hear only a, a sliver today. But... Leah, thank you very much. We're delighted to have you here. Thank you. All right. Um, first, before I get started, thank you so much, Jennifer, for that uh, introduction. And thank you to the Hutchins Center and the Du Bois Fellowship Program uh, for making this possible. This semester has been... Um, you know, a little bit of a roller coaster for me because of you know uh, because of some personal issues, but it's also been an incredible blessing in that I've had an enormous amount of time, not only to pour through um, pour through a lot of these documents, um, but also to have really uh, important conversations. Uh, important conversations, and then make a lot of headway in terms of writing. Um, it's also been an interesting period because. Uh, because as I've been working on this project, um, I've also been doing a lot of work in public about contemporary political culture and uh, political activities. 
And so one of the things that has emerged has been the overlap between the two periods. You know, I used to worry about having to make uh, very clear and very explicit what are the present day implications for the research that I'm doing, when in fact the present is doing it for me. Um, <laughs> So with that, um, I kind of want to talk about some of, those, some of the origins of this. And I thought I'd start out, and I really like, to, I always like to start out my talks with a story. And I'm going to start out with the example uh, of, I'm going to make sure I have my clicker, uh, the example of uh, Lance Wilson. Now Lance Wilson, wrote a reporter for the Wall Street Journal, looked like someone who had just stepped off the pages of GQ magazine. He was polished, he was unflappable, he was effortlessly at ease, whether in the doggy dog, dog world of the Wall Street or the drab hallways of the federal government. Wilson, who had grown up in working class Brooklyn before graduating from the University of Pennsylvania Law School, was the epitome of a kind of new upper middle class wealthy black professional of the 1980s. In fact, he was almost a caricature uh, if we go by the trappings of success model. Six-figure salary, expensive Jaguar, personal yacht, a million-dollar condominium on the Upper East Side, uh, a summer house in Long Island, et cetera, et cetera. Before the, I know, wow. <laughs> Before joining the investment banking firm Payne Weber as a vice president in the mid-1980s, Wilson had worked in the Ronald Reagan Helm White House, where he had earned a reputation for his political savvy, disarming charm and intelligence, and where he had also accumulated an all-star Rolodex of political heavy hitters. When he resigned from the administration in 1984, around the age of 32 years old, uh, more than 700 black Republicans and Vice President George H.W. Bush gathered at a swanky $150 per plate gala to wish him well. Now, during his three years in the White House, Wilson was part of a small group of commanding black professionals in policy-making positions. Many of them had arrived from the private sector, bringing their corporate experience with them. They also brought their politics, seeing how most, like Wilson, were members of the Republican Party. As one black official explained, it was, quote, widely known that you couldn't get a job in the Reagan administration unless you worked on its political campaigns. The handful of Democrats in their midst, at the very least, had to express their unquestioning faith in the religion of tax cuts, deregulation, and of course, the free market. Simeon Booker, writing for Ebony Magazine, applauded the black professionals' rise in the White House, suggesting that those in this small group possess some clout and are in a position uh, to control the little funding money available. By gaining access to the exclusive club of the largely white White House, black professionals, Simeon declared, might soon hold the fate of black people in their hands. But if Wilson represented the highs and the ambitions of black professionals turned political class, then he most certainly also represented a cautionary tale about the lows. By 1989, Wilson was enmeshed in a complex corruption scandal uh, coursing through those same drab hallways of the federal government. To give you a small example, uh, congressional investigators would estimated that Wilson earned $2 million in profits through the unethical sale of four government housing projects. In 1992, a federal jury indicted Wilson on 24 counts of wrongdoing, including charges of fraud, conspiracy, and false statements. He was not alone. Many of these black professionals found themselves ensnared in Reagan-era government scandals. As details of various corruption outrages emerged, it became increasingly clear that a number of Reagan's black professionals had participated in a selfish game of deception as a part of a broader scheme to plunder federal coffers uh, to line their own pockets. The notion of linked fate for African Americans, it would seem, was dead and had been replaced by a ruthless individualism, at least in the White House. In many ways, Reagan's black professionals looked a lot like their white counterparts in the administration. Over the course of nearly two decades, Congress and the Justice Department investigated, indicted, and convicted hundreds of lobbyists, consultants, and federal, uh, federal officials across agencies, department, and industries for actions related to their time in the Reagan administration. Wilson and other black professionals like him, but were one part of these overarching scandals that plagued the White House. And while they participated and often enabled and exacerbated uh, the scandals, they weren't the architects of the corruption. They simply didn't have enough power to do that. What makes Reagan's black professionals' involvement stand out is the fact that so many of them participated in the cor corruption at all. Looking back in the period, it's as if HUD officials, including black HUD officials, gleefully embodied Gordon Gekko's infamous catchphrase from the film Wall Street, greed is good. 
Nearly all of the black professionals caught in the controversies hailed from one area of the Reagan administration, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD. By 1998, the Justice Department had convicted 16 people of criminal offenses connected to the misappropriation of four to eight billion dollars in funding meant for Section 8 low-income housing programs. I'm gonna repeat that number because it's really, really important. Four to eight billion dollars meant for Section 8 housing programs. Their lot included real estate developers, two HUD sec assistant secretaries, Reagan's uh, interior secretary, the U.S. treasurer, Al and Al Gore's cousin, who also happened to be the stepdaughter of John Mitchell of Watergate infamy. Nearly half of the people in this group were black. This included Lance Wilson, uh, Du Bois Gilliam, who uh, was a high-ranking official at HUD, and Lenny Briscoe, a Texas and Florida-based real estate developer. The HUD investigation also exposed the questionable practices of hundreds of other elites, including, including dozens of black leaders who escaped indictment, including the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, Senator Edward Brooke, Charles Evers, who has been back in the news lately, the brother of slain civil rights activist Medgar Evers, Lionel Hampton, the jazz musician, and Reverend Thaddeus Garrett, the Reagan official and former domestic policy advisor to Democratic Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm. New types of political partnerships and helped enable the corruption at HUD during this period. Now when I say new, what I mean is that there were, these were desegregated partnerships because for the first time, black people were included in these partisan schemes. So for instance, HUD official Deborah Gordeen, who I have up here again, uh, amassed an exclusively interracial group at HUD nicknamed the Brat Pack that ultimately made weighty funding decisions in between bouts of wild parties and lavish dinners. As Du Bois Gilliam noted, if you didn't sit at that table, you didn't eat. In other words, these types of relationships didn't really exist prior to this moment, because how could they? Black professionals just simply weren't moving within these white Republican worlds prior to the late 1970s. Other partnerships, however, while still political to some degree, were bipartisan in nature, driven by a calculated interest in exploiting the unregulated free market. Take, for example, Paul Manafort, who we should all know by now. And if you don't, I would encourage you to pick up a newspaper. Uh, Donald Trump's former uh, campaign manager. Um, between 1986 and 1987, Manafort influenced peddling in his own words, on behalf of his real estate development clients, which included himself, pocketed more than $30 million in federal monies designated for low-income public housing, while also raking in $300,000 in consulting fees. Wow. It took two more years to discover that Manabrook's, Manbro Manafort's Seabrook housing project in New Jersey was a sham. When congressional officials surveyed the properties, they found residents living in horrifying conditions, leaky, rotted, and collapsed roofs, exposed electrical wiring hanging from the ceilings and walls, missing front doors, missing refrigerators and stoves, predatory high rents, garbage and fecal matter everywhere, and more. It was, in the words of Connecticut Republican Christopher Shays, very smelly, very sleazy business. Manafort never faced an indictment or prosecution for his role in the HUD scandal. In fact, the notoriety from the scandal would end up bringing him uh, even newer and bigger clients. By 1990, for instance, and get ready for this one, his domestic clients included Donald Trump. His international clients included Mobutu Seko of Zaire, who declared that he was impressed by Manafort's ability to dodge prosecution for unethical and possibly illegal behaviors. Manafort's black business partner, right there, Victor Cruz, however, wasn't so lucky. The prominent Connecticut real estate developer, who was also a Democrat, uh, ended up being indicted on charges related to the Seabrook fiasco. Though eventually acquitted, the uh, multi-year ordeal destroyed Cruz's professional life and career. Now the plunder of HUD and the actions of housing officials are made all the more significant when paralleled with those of Ronald Reagan. Early in his first term, the president targeted HUD, gutting the department through a series of draconian budget cuts. Between 81 and 89, no department saw its budget ransacked more than HUD. Between 1981 and 87, for instance, Reagan reduced low-income housing subsidies by more than 60%. Uh, 
Conservative and liberal sources estimate that the total reduction in HUD funding at somewhere between 54 to 78% over the course of Reagan's two terms in office. Uh, what this indicates is that HUD faced the severest budget cuts of any Reagan cabinet uh, department. And to put it in perspective, out of all the other cabinets, only one other department saw its budget cut shrink during this period, and that was by less than 4%. The rest of the departments actually increased their budgets during this period. HUD was Reagan's go-to federal punching bag a convenient symbol of government waste and excess. For the president, each cut was something to be celebrated, proof that he was making good on his campaign promise to downsize the government and drain the swamp of federal bureaucracy. Likewise, Reagan's interest in solutions to poverty revolved solely around the self-help and personal responsibility kind. If you were poor, it was your own fault. In an appearance on Good Morning America in 84, for example, the president awkwardly argued that homeless people were, quote, Homeless by choice. The nation's poor and working classes felt the burdens of these reductions. This was especially true of black men and women as they were disproportionately represented amongst this population. The cuts in housing coupled with other sweeping reductions and social and welfare spending had a lasting effect on any number of domestic issues including homelessness, uh, availability of affordable safe and quality housing, and black wealth creation. That political elites, with the full knowledge of the decimated budget and often publicly and privately cheering the cuts, would spend eight years looting billions from money meant for poor and low-income communities is egregious. In the words of the Newsweek editorial board, HUD officials were, quote, poverty pimps getting rich and powerful by subverting programs intended to help the poor. Almost no scholarship has covered the HUD scandal or the implications for varying dimensions of race and class. While concerning, this isn't surprising given that nearly everyone missed the plunder of HUD while it was happening. There are reasons for this neglect, of course. Public housing fatigue from previous uh, housing mishaps and previous uh, administrations, public distaste for the technicalities of housing policy, increasing partisanship and the politicization of the federal government, uh, reinforcing messages from the White House that there was no need for HUD to exist, uh, and of course, public disregard and disinterest in the affected communities, black and poor. There's also, that the there's also the fact that the failure of democracy captured in the nuances of the HUD scandal simply weren't visible in the public at the time, uh, who initially saw nothing wrong with HUD's dramatic transformation during the, uh, during the period. In other words, for many Americans, democracy was working as intended despite the outward harm being done to black and poor communities. Now, foregrounding HUD in the 1980s and exploring the dimensions of this scandal is critical to a new understanding of the era. In this sense, the HUD corruption scandal is a useful heuristic lens for exploring socially and politically substantive issues of race, class, uh, and political ideology. Uh, in an attempt to complicate the canon surrounding the narrative of race, class, and the Reagan 1980s, my project grapples with what scholar Jody Melamed has described as the diffuse and deadly capacities of administrative power, or in this case, the Reagan administration, to give license to do racial and economic harm through seemingly neutral repertoires of democratic governance. Moreover, these kinds of scenarios and efforts, as scholar uh, Mimi Guyen writes, often involve a variety of agencies and officials recruited by the state as a means of ensuring command and control and criminalizing those communities of, or avenues of resistance. Now, Guyen specifically points to groups like corporate mercenaries, legislators, lobbyists, bureaucrats, and administrative officials, in, additional, in addition to traditional state methods like increased policing and surveillance. Simply put, as Reagan officials, including black officials, are plundering the coffers of the federal government and destroying HUD's budget in the 1980s, they are simultaneously telling those affected people and communities that it's their own fault for being poor, while also taking punitive measures to uh, ensure securitization of this approach through laws and policies, moralistic codes, and even the control of material and physical spaces, like patrolling neighborhoods, or even taking neighborhoods away through the destruction of HUD properties, properties and moratoriums on new construction of low-income housing or drastically limiting housing vouchers. Thus, the heart of the story is really set during Ronald Reagan's two-term tenure at 1600 Pennsylvania a Avenue and absolutely has to include uh, the stories of Reagan's black professionals who contributed to the exploitation uh, who, uh, of, of the very same communities from which many of them hailed. This was also a period at HUD where the turmoil, uh, where the turmoil intersected and collided with explosive racial events uh, from across other federal agencies and departments. In truth, 
These social political environments of the era emerged long before Reagan's 1980 presidential victory. When the former actor entered the White House, he did so with the support of just 14% of black voters compared to 56% of white voters. By 1984, Reagan's black support had dropped to a mere 9%. Compare that to his white support, which had increased to 66%. And I, here I should also mention that the drop off appears to come largely from black professionals, uh, such as one Mississippi uh, businessman who wrote, you know, uh, who explained, you know, I agree with the Republican Party's philosophy on taxes, but I just can't support them anymore because they're not doing anything for our people. In short, this isn't simply political polarization, it's racial polarization as well. The majority of black people viewed Ronald Reagan and his agenda in a very different light than the majority of white people. African Americans viewed the president and his disciples with suspicion. Among other faults, they saw him as a hardliner, a reactionary conservative who had long argued that, the civil, rights that civil rights legislation was unconstitutional, had deployed racially charged stereotypes like that of the welfare queen or lazy, devious government dependent African Americans, had launched his 1980 campaign by discussing states' rights in Philadelphia, Mississippi, the same town where three civil rights workers had been murdered 16 years earlier, uh, and had promised as president to roll back the civil rights and color conscious policy gains of the previous half century. Now, black newspapers, civic organizations, civil rights leaders, churches, and everyday citizens quickly describe Reagan as a threat to black survival. There are appealing features. There are appealing features in uh, Reaganism, the Reverend Jesse Jackson warned in 1981, just like there is with Kool-Aid and cyanide. <laughs> a sweet taste, but if you keep on drinking, there's gonna be a massive fallout. African Americans could point to any number of offenses to bolster their accusations. Rhetoric was one thing, but the reality of Ronald Reagan's policies was another thing entirely. Poor and working class black communities saw their problems mag magnified and exacerbated by the new federalism and Reaganomics. Tax cuts trickled down economics, increased policing of black communities, the punitive measures of the war on drugs, and radical reductions in domestic social spending. Quote, whether elderly or non-elderly, husband, wife, or female-headed, black families have fared relatively poorly over the last four years, offered one study from 1984. Yet another study from that year showed that while a, small, while a small black middle class was expanding, even African Americans with, quote, conventional middle class lifestyles had suffered under the president's agenda. Reagan was nothing more than a reverse Robin Hood, argued uh, Harry Belafonte, the prominent black celebrity and activist, taking from the poor and giving to the rich. In many ways, this gets to the heart of ish the issue. Many of these criticisms weren't simply aimed at Ronald Reagan, they were also warnings aimed at the black appointees that worked within the administration and the small cadre of black people, especially the black middle class, that might be seduced by the softer economic tenets of Reagan's new federalism, like tax cuts, free enterprise zones, and deregulation. Now, in the larger book project, I explored this world through an analysis of two perspectives. The first is that of the black political appointees at HUD, black men, men and women like Lance Wilson who move seamlessly back and forth between the public, the public and the newly desegregated private sector throughout the 1980s. Uh, many of them thought that their embrace of Reagan and Reaganomics would catapult them to new levels of influence and power. The central and most significant figure here is Samuel R. Pierce Jr., Ronald Reagan's HUD secretary from 1981 through 1989. Now, if Lance Wilson was the epitome of the highs and lows of the new black professional, well, then Samuel Pierce was the granddaddy of the highs and lows of the black professional. Indeed, Pierce had been Wilson's mentor since 1972, introduced him to GOP politics, and brought him into the Reagan administration. And in fact, this is actually the story for most of the black appointees in the Reagan administration. They come through, uh, they come through Pierce. He is the central figure in untangling the significance of the HUD scandal. Uh, he's also crucial to understanding the broader racial politics of the Reagan-led White House. Now, the second perspective comes in the form of the grassroots or the black men and women who fought back during the period, challenging HUD at the local, state, and federal level in a number of different ways. Black HUD career employees, uh, for instance, repeatedly sued the administration, leaking incriminating documents to the press, and filed dozens of grievance reports accusing Pierce and HUD of racial discrimination, mismanagement, and theft. Black women housing activists across the country, like Dorothy King in Colorado, who's pictured above, uh, staged sit-ins and public protests steeped in spectacle to call attention to the disastrous impact of HUD's policies. Showing these two contrasting narratives concurrently is crucial to this, this project. 
one top down from the upper tiers of government and the other bottom up from the grassroots of the communities most affected by HUD officials' actions. Taking this approach allows for the obvious contrasting not only of the extremes of these groups, but also allows for a comparison of the unexpected parallels of the larger story. More on that later, I promise. Now, I, will, I wish I could really go into all depth on all of this today. I'm going to actually spend my remaining time focused on analyzing some of the networks and ideologies that inform the HUD scandal through an examination of the intertwining histories of Samuel Pierce and Kimmy Gray, a public housing activist from Washington, DC. The concept of corruption resists ideological explanation. And indeed, as we have seen, the looting of HUD was at times a bipartisan affair. But at the same time, adherence to a particular set of ideological beliefs exacerbated the corruption of the era, paving the way for massive public, uh, federal plunder. Multiple, multiple investigations found that the spirit of Reagan's new federalism had intensified the corruption at HUD. Developers and officials increasingly turned to unethical and illegal means to secure funding because funds were so tight. Likewise, political loyalty tests uh, became a method for doling out rewards and punishing enemies. In the larger narrative, the White House bears full responsibility for creating the kind of environment that led to this corruption. Uh, it's not simply policies or agendas, but it also was leadership. In other words, you might call it a trickle-down effect. An example from 1982 is illustrative here. While the president was out campaigning for a woman uh, aptly named Millicent Fenwick, a Republican senatorial candidate from New Jersey, he spontaneously promised $6 million in HUD funding for a senior citizen's housing project. This despite the fact that there was no money for such a project and New Jersey hadn't even applied for a HUD grant. Reagan then joked, if you don't elect Fenwick as senator, we'll take the money away. So yes, Reagan was joking in this moment, but he's also deadly serious. He was setting a tone about how HUD should run. Support me and you'll be rewarded. Cross me and you'll be punished. For Samuel Pierce, who had always been a good and loyal Republican, the message from that incident was clear. Bewildered HUD officials in Atlanta quickly realized that their pre-approved project funding had disappeared, the monies having been quietly reassigned to New Jersey. So when we talk about institutionalizing harm, against, the state institutionalizing harm against its citizens, this is precisely what we mean. Through the actions of officials and bureaucrats, including black officials, following marching orders from the top. In some respects, Sam Pierce represents a bit of a mystery in the historical rest, uh, record. The central question, both throughout his time in office, but even today, uh, and throughout the 10-year congressional investigation into Pierce, was who is he and what would drive him to such actions? Now, assessing the behaviors and beliefs of Pierce is akin to analyzing the co a contradiction. His presence as the highest ranking black person in the Reagan administration, the longest serving cabinet member, at a level of complexity to the narrative of HUD in the 80s. His race and partisan affiliation make it even harder and more difficult to tease out his full identity and what his identity represented to different groups uh, of, and communities. In many ways, I would argue that this is at the, what's at the heart uh, of the crisis or the paradox of the black professional. And while Pierce's Republican identity is important, I'd also argue that more generally, this crisis is one that transcends partisanship to some degree. What are the realities of this post-civil rights generation of middle class to upper middle class black people who desegregate the world of white people and whiteness in institutions that were never created for them? Colleges, corporate boards, Wall Street, the White House. Pierce came of age when integration was the civil rights solution uh, and where mainstream sh a mainstream strain of black political ideology suggested that racial equality could be achieved simply by, quote, having a seat at the table. Likewise, it's Pierce who brings these black men and women into the Republican fold, thereby becoming the prototype for their notions of black professional successes and equality. At the same time, he symbolizes the last of a rapidly disappearing group of black liberal and uh, moderate Republicans whose conservatism was tempered by their sense of racial community. So much of what we're seeing with Pierce and the other black Reagan officials is a transition into a new wave of black Republican politics that had begun to move in coordination with Ronald Reagan's new GOP. Now, what did this mean? Well, it meant that Pierce and a number of other black officials made conscious and conspicuous decisions about power, survival, and their own individual advancement as black men and women in an administration openly hostile to civil rights and enamored with the free market. Now, on paper, Samuel Pierce was the definition of an exceptional Negro, and I won't go into all the details of his background, although I'm, I'm happy to discuss this. 
you know, he graduates from Cornell University, Phi Beta Kappa. He earns law degrees from multiple institutions, including Yale. Uh, he has a stint as a U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York. Uh, he's almost ambassador to Liberia, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, most importantly, in 1970, he's appointed by Richard Nixon uh, to serve as the general counsel for the U.S. Treasury, Treasury which establishes him as the highest ranking uh, black person in the federal government in 1970. Throughout his career, Pierce also enjoys long stretches of the private sector. Um, and by the time he accepted a job in the Reagan administration in 1981, he was a very wealthy man. In 1961, he becomes the first black attorney general to join and make partner at a major renowned law firm, labor law firm. During that same period, he becomes the uh, first black African American to integrate the upper echelons of powerhouse corporations, such as US Industries, Prudential, and General Electric. Like many black corporate integrationists of the 1960s, he walked this precarious tightrope, integrating the hallways of white institutions while also maintaining a connection to civil rights communities. But his presence wasn't like the on the ground activist, activism that we associate with the black freedom struggle. Instead, it reflected a kind of black politics that celebrated capitalism as a defining feature of uplift. And firm, uh, so once we see that, uh, we see that uh, coupled with the desegregation of the free market, Pierce argues that this represent a new kind of post-civil rights black power. So we see examples of this in things like the uh, Pierce's co-founding uh, an organization called Freedom National Bank in Harlem, uh, which is a prime example, and he co-founds it with uh, Jackie Robinson, the baseball legend, um, co-founding this uh, as an example of free market social justice. So the idea is that because African Americans are discriminated against and can't put their money into, uh, into mainstream banks, that they'll, it is a civil rights effort to put their money into a black bank and that it would work in favor and black people would be able to get loans and take out mortgages and things like that. Though rooted in conservative ideas about black economics, this was a bipartisan push. Martin Luther King Jr. was among the bank's most notable clients. He just deposited his Nobel Peace Prize winnings uh, in the Harlem Bank soon after its launch that King would lend his support to Pierce's free market ideas uh, in 1964 isn't that surprising because earlier that year, Pierce had successfully defended King along with Ralph Abernathy, Joseph Lowery, uh, Fred Shuttlesworth in the landmark Supreme Court case, New York Times uh, v. Sullivan. Now Pierce's highlight reel of accomplishments only partially reveal his ideological motivations. In truth, we need to strip back a veneer of polish to actually see what drove him and what ideology shaped his approach to politics. The reality was anything, uh, so when he talks about, you know, to see what drove his ideologies, but also what drove his actions at HUD. You know, when we actually look at something like his background, he always talked about have coming from this rosy, middle class, upper middle class, integrated background. The reality is anything but that. Until his death, Pierce's father labored six days out of the week at a whites-only country club in Long Island, where he served food, shined shoes, and laundered clothes. The family's integrated Glen Cove neighborhood was segregated in practice, offering constantly ugly and sometimes violent reminders of the stark race and class divide. Pierce's family history also reveals a, also reveals a family constantly wrestling with the, compl the complications of racism and elitism, and who oftentimes replicated oppressive hierarchies in their efforts to overcome them. Now, Pierce's father ingrained all of these distinct lessons about race, class, status, and advancement uh, in his son that would ultimately end up driving much of Pierce's uh, career and decision making. Money and access to exclusive spaces were necessary priorities for black uplift, according to the elder Pierce. Money conveyed power, offering the only pathway to the fulfillment of African-American dreams. And while Pierce Sr. taught his son that power was located solely in white institutions, he also cautioned him to remain vigilant and to never underestimate the treachery of whites. Perhaps the most revealing insight into Pierce Sr.'s guiding philosophy was his acknowledgement of the racist shortcomings of the free market. But contrast that with his faith that African-Americans could still manipulate a broken exploitative system to their advantage. Quote, whites will give blacks a lot of latitude, the elder Pierce told Sam, if the black individual in question was it had exploitable skills and can do something well. What's remarkable, though, is that Pierce's father's message wasn't necessarily unique for the era. The notion that, quote, the best revenge is your paper and that money equals power is a message that has long been familiar in black communities across class and partisanship. And what's unique here is that Pierce chose the Republican Party to which to advance these ideas and then stuck with it even as African Americans were fleeing in droves. 
In no uncertain terms, or so the argument went, success came by virtue of playing, the white man's, playing by the white man's rules while also remaining quietly or silently skeptical of white intentions. For casual observers, however, that last part, the silent skepticism, was all but invisible. Instead, most people saw a black man eager to play by the white man's rules. This included senior officials at the Federal Bureau of uh, Investigation, or the FBI. In January 1964, uh, Agency Director J. Edgar Hoover signed off on a senior official's proposal to discredit and destroy Martin Luther King Jr. and replace him with Samuel Pierce. There's a level of irony to this kind of plotting on behalf of the FBI, given that the same week that Hoover signed off on this, uh, uh, Pierce was working successfully on King's behalf as his lawyer in the New York Times case. Still, even as the FBI failed to act on its proposal, apparently never even reaching out to Pierce, the perception that Pierce was a black man who only played by the white man's rules stuck, even as he, increased, increased, uh, even as he achieved increasing success in black and white communities. Uh, just to give you an example, Pierce and Henry, Congressman Henry Gonzalez, Democratic com uh, Congressman Henry Gonzalez, nearly came to physical blows during a 1982 congressional budget hearing uh, after the Texas politician called the black secretary step and fetch it and accused of him of acting of, as Reagan's housing henchman and destroying poor black and brown communities. Media figures, politicians from both parties, and even congressional aides widely ridiculed Pierce as Silent Sam for his allegedly submissive demeanor and invisibility in the White House. Even now, in those rare moments where Pierce's name is conjured up, he is largely remembered for showing up to work late and leaving early, for watching soap operas in his office, playing backgammon with his aides, for shunning the DC social and political scene, preferring to stay home with frozen pizza, for failing to know what specific program and grants fell under housing's jurisdiction, for driving a lavish car on the taxpayer's dime, the most expensive of anyone within the Reagan administration, or for the Mr. Mayor incident, wherein Ronald Reagan publicly greeted the sole black member of his cabinet as if he were the mayor of an unnamed city less than six months after Pierce had been sworn in as HUD secretary. <laughs> Sam, his friend and fellow black Republican Gloria Toot offered, isn't brash, he knows his place. When Pierce arrived in the White House in 1981, he was also probably well aware that he had been a last minute replacement for the HUD slot. He had gotten the job, uh, gotten the position through his political connections, so he considered it a victory nonetheless. Loyalty was everything to this administration and to the Republican Party, and Pierce repeatedly declared his intentions to be a good team player. Quote, there's no mystery as to why the FBI's right kind of Negro leader was also Ronald Reagan's right kind of Negro leader. Quote, there's no mystery as to why the FBI's right kind of Negro leader was also Ronald Reagan's right kind of Negro leader. Quote, there's no mystery as to why the FBI's right kind of Negro leader was also Ronald Reagan's right kind of Negro leader. Quote, there's no mystery as to why the FBI's right kind of Negro leader was also Ronald Reagan's right kind of Negro leader. Quote, there's no mystery as to why the FBI's right kind of Negro leader was also Ronald Reagan's right kind of Negro leader. Quote, there's no mystery as to why the FBI's right kind of Negro leader was also Ronald Reagan's right kind of Negro leader. Quote, there's no mystery as to why the FBI's right kind of Negro leader was also Ronald Reagan's right kind of Negro leader. Quote, there's no mystery as to why the FBI's right kind of Negro leader was also Ronald Reagan's right kind of Negro leader. Quote, there's no Pierce made it increasingly clear that he wanted the choicest of rewards for his loyalty, a seat on the US Supreme Court. A broader reading of the evidence from the period also uncovers a complicated story of a conflicted man working in the highest ranks of the federal government who had cagely played by the white man's rules for decades and who earnestly believed that a seat at the integrated table represented power for himself and for his community. During his eight years at HUD, Pierce vacillated wildly between despondency and indifference, enthusiasm, optimism. He was committed to civil rights, going to great lengths, for example, to force concessions from the Reagan administration on fair housing policies and laws. But he was also responsible for orchestrating the transition away from the construction of low-income housing to a limited system of housing vouchers, which measurably contributed to the nation's inequality and homelessness crisis. As Pierce signed off on billions in housing budget cuts uh, and billions in subsidies and payouts for pro uh, projects from friends and political cronies, he was also heavily involved in a number of civil rights projects. Minority Business Enterprise, the Martin Luther King Jr. Federal Holiday, federal holiday forcing the administration to pass a progressive fair housing initiative, uh, fighting to preserve affirmative action, and invest, uh, investigating the 1985 move bombing in Philadelphia and don't actually donating $1 million in HUD funding and 40 houses to house the nearly 300 uh, displaced people. Now, black communities' response to Pierce perceptively captures the tension of this moment. Uh, in letters to the editor, uh, uh, for example, black people express equal parts of rage and delight over the per performance of Sam Pierce in the 1980s. In 82, CPA Magazine crowned Pierce the number one Oreo cookie of the year. Uh, soon thereafter, the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change awarded the secretary with its highest award, the MLK Jr. Special Award for embodying the legacy of social justice and social responsibility in the tradition of King. So even as black people berated Pierce, they also celebrated him. 
Now, we can explain this in part by really thinking about how uh, at least black public opinion, at least before the fallout from the scandal, was tied to Pierce's race and his political identity. So for those who saw Pierce as an extension of Ronald Reagan, and ha uh, they hated him for it, while others saw him as an invaluable ally on the inside. These tensions tell us something about the nature of power, not just about how Pierce and the black Reagan appointees ruthlessly rationalized this uh, and their plunder, later on their plunder, but also how some black people, more than we initially imagined, also saw the manipulation of an exploitative system as an avenue to black empowerment and uplift. To be clear, I'm not suggesting that grassroots communities resisted through these methods. Instead, I'm arguing that there are unexpected parallels and overlaps in the actions of these radically different groups of African Americans. Now, Kimmy Gray, a renowned public housing activist from Washington, DC, is one such person. Unlike Pierce, she was not a black professional. She was a grassroots organizer. She was not a member of the black elites, the political elite, or even the Republican Party, for that matter. But like Pierce, Gray's story pushes back against the boundaries of categorization. A lifelong Democrat, Gray's ideas about empowerment also revealed strains of black nationalism and philosophies of self-help. More to the point, almost all of her ideas about public housing rested on her faith in exploiting a capitalist system for the benefit of poor black people. To her, power came from manipulating an unjust system to her advantage rather than overturning, them, uh, overturning it. We're the greatest survivors in the world, Gray once declared, referring to poor African Americans. It was a philosophy she'd share hundreds of times in radically different environment, dissimilar spaces, from the halls of Congress to the housing projects of Washington, DC, as, a pres as president of the Kenilworth Parkside Resident Management Corporation. I'm just gonna call it Kenilworth because that's a mouthful. It's a tenant-run management organization that's launched in 1982. Within eight years, Kenilworth uh, um, purchases its own projects, meaning that the residents and their management group now own their public housing, as opposed to the federal government owning and managing the properties. As one of the driving forces of a national tenants management movement, Gray, along with half a dozen other black women from around the country, uh, including here in Boston, or Cambridge, Boston, also helped launch similar tenant-led organizations in dozens of cities, including New Orleans, St. Louis, and Cleveland. The idea for Kenilworth actually emerged in the early 1970s after residents of the DC Housing Project received a HUD rehabilitation grant designed to help the community spruce up its surroundings. Over the next few years, locals protested as HUD funding failed to materialize and as they watched their homes deteriorate. Their complaints of collapsed roofs and heatless apartments lacking hot water were met from, with silence from HUD, from local, regional, and federal HUD officials. By the late 1970s, residents in Kenilworth argued that they were isolated and forgotten and that they had been betrayed by their leaders and elected officials. Quote, the government man, and it ain't just a little DC government who's giving, one frustrated resident, uh, teenage resident groused in 1978, the big government on the hill is jiving too. Just look at those black, big black limos pulling into the White House for parties. My daddy's taxes are paying for that. We ought to knock all them dudes off their jobs. They ain't doing nothing for us. In casual conversation, this notion of they repeatedly cropped up among Kenilworth residents. By they, tenants explicitly meant the white establishment in Congress as they saw politicians as out of touch elites invested in a corrupt system. To some extent, political partisan or affiliation was meaningless here to residents since they saw politicians from both parties as dishonest charlatans. As such, residents regularly accused local black leaders and officials as having sold out to the white establishment and deliberately abandoning and sabotaging uplift and advancement opportunities for poor and working class people. Quote, they, I call it the mushroom principle of welfare, Kimmy Gray uh, once explained to a reporter. They keep us in the dark, they feed us shit, and then sit back and see how much we grow. And how much can you grow living in the dark, eating shit? By 1978, Gray and Kenilworth Park residents had placed their faith in Democratic politician Marion Barry, cheering his mayoral candidacy as an authentic representation of grassroots black communities in the district, even as the former activist slyly dubbed himself a fiscal conservative. And just so you know, there was a black Republican in this race, Arthur Fletcher. Gray and the residents of the housing project absolutely did not support him. In 1979, as one of his first post-victory acts, uh, Barry appointed Gray as president of the district's public housing advisory council. She then turned her attention back to tenants' rights, advocating for the federal government to convert public housing projects into resident-owned and managed properties. 
I want to own the plantations, Gray declared while speaking to a black audience in 1980. Yes, the plantations. That's what public housing communities are, aren't they? Gray's embrace of Marion Barry and her push for concepts of self-help, ownership, and self-determination in public housing were very much a response to and a rejection of this notion of they uh, and government abandonment. She and other residents of Kenilworth Parkland argued that through such actions, they could control their own destinies rather than relying on corrupt politicos and institutions designed to, to work against poor people. What is most surprising, however, is that after the launch of Kenilworth, the Kenilworth Association, Gray quickly became a favorite of those very same political circles that she continued to rail against. In 1983, Gray and Kenilworth received a $13 million renovation grant from HUD. Our model, Gray observed after receiving the award, has been, quote, practicing what Reagan has been preaching, self-help. Consider, too, that Gray is saying this during a period where black and, brown, uh, black and poor communities, like her own, are being decimated by HUD. She stands in contrast, for example, to the black women from another DC housing project uh, who repeatedly sued HUD in the 1980s. Now, as a charismatic, outspoken, and by all accounts irresistible force, Gray quickly became a regular visitor to Capitol Hill. Throughout the 1980s, she frequently testified in congressional hearings at the request of Republicans and Democrats. She once, for instance, led Congressman Jack Kemp and uh, Congressman Henry Gonzalez on a bipartisan tour of her housing project. She was also a regular at the White House, becoming a favored guest of Ronald Reagan, given her enthusiastic support for self-help programs and housing vouchers. While remaining active, or remaining active in the Democratic Party politics, Gray had no problem partitioning conservatives and Republicans for funding and assistance. She frequently brainstormed with conservative policy experts at the Heritage Foundation and the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise. Most astonishing, between 1983 and 1993, Gray would become one of the primary faces of Ronald Reagan and later George H.W. Bush's housing policies and HUD. Uh, and just a note, when Jack Kemp gets sworn in as HUD secretary in 1989, Kimmy Gray is standing behind him. Despite this, even among black Democrats, Gray was hailed as an innovative hero for her ideas, even as her philosophies amounted to calling uh, for the elimination of the state from the lives of blacks and, uh, black and poor people. Now, Gray was still no less uh, skeptical of the white establishment. She, con con she continued to assume that most, if not all, politicians and political institutions were corrupt and that mainstream capitalist systems didn't value the poor. So essentially what Gray is doing here is manipulating the system and the state in an attempt to beat it at its own game. Her solution was to take advantage of broken political institutions as a means of survival, pushing her agenda through any avenue receptive to her proposal, irrespective of partisanship or ideology. So just to wrap up, when I look at the example of Kimmy Gray, I see someone who is not all that different from Samuel Pierce. Yes, there's clearly an imbalance of influence, power, and elite status, and there's also their professed partisan affiliation. But at the same time, Gray and Pierce's ideologies weren't all that different, particularly when you consider notions of survival. Likewise, Gray's uh, philosophical approach to politics was not unlike the guiding advice dispensed by Samuel Pierce's father a generation earlier. When he, uh, when he encouraged his son to remain skeptical of white treachery while simultaneously taking advantage of white latitude as a means of attaining power and money, and in this case, material property. To wit, quote, my grandmother used to tell me, don't let the white folk fool you, Gray once mused. The fight is not about race or po uh, poverty, it's about owning land. Part of the difficulty in what I've laid out today is that it operates in a liminal space. The larger canon doesn't necessarily address these issues in part because black partisanship or assumptions of black partisanship and black political behavior obscure a more complex narrative. So in short, we wouldn't even think to put Gray and Pierce together because the surface level pieces don't fit even as we see these kinds of scenarios repeatedly in the past and in the present. And just to give you a present day example, the face at one point of the, um, of, uh, the uh, school voucher system in, uh, in the United States is a black woman from Florida. So more to the point, by examining these intersections, we can also begin to see how these networks are not only laying the groundwork for the development and prolifer proliferation of a black neoconservative outlook, but how this is doing work in the service of establishing a kind of black neoliberalism. So I'm gonna end there, and hopefully we can have good conversation during the Q&A. Thank you.
Yet? Okay. Leah, that was fabulous. That was great. Questions, comments? Just one little footnote. Um, did you say that Sam was the first black person to integrate corporate boards? One of the first. Oh, okay. He's not the first, he's the second. Yeah, well, Vernon's the first, right? Uh, supposedly Sam, Robert Weaver is the first. He's the first? And then there are like three of them, but Vernon is, is right in that area too, right around that time as well. And so and, it's Jewel LaFontaine. And, and, and Jewel? And Jewel LaFontaine, yep. You're right, okay. And then, unlike the others, so Vernon then opened the door and it continued to integrate you know, the boards. But the creation of Freedom's Bank is fascinating. And there's a connection, I think, um, with um, Nelson Rockefeller through Dick Parsons. And I'm, I'm not sure if Dick was one of the people involved with the founding of that bank, but he certainly became involved with the founding, uh, or with the progress of um, Freedom Bank. And so it's just something you might check because that fits in with your analysis of the, the um, well, I don't know what you would call it now. Then it was the sort of liberal wing of the Republican Party. Now they would all be Democrats, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but and and Dick Parsons' role in that group. You know, all these guys were friends. Mm -hmm. the, the power elite, was a, the black power elite, was about. I mean, they hung out together. They're still friends, right. um, and that's an important thing to remember too. So it's not a surprise that King is then asked to place his check in the Freedom Bank. And then, what, 10 years later or whatever, 20 years later, they, they give him the Martin Luther King Award. And it's like every other power elite. Now, I'm not saying anything you don't know, but it's that there weren't really fissures among this group. They, they all hung out together. They played bid whist together. They talked trash together. They would have emailed each other if they had had uh, email. They were, they were <laughs> like in a club. And they, they vacation still, together, yeah. Yeah, and they still are. You know, it's the, whether they're Republicans um, or not. But did you think he was a victim? I mean, his fall was monumental. So... And I don't know him, yeah. you know. I just know him by right. reputation. But did they hang him out to dry or... Well, they absolutely, I mean, they absolutely hang him out to dry. Um, it, it ends up nearly bankrupting his family. There are all these documents... Uh, towards the end of the trial where he's writing to the, um, writing to the Justice Department uh, asking, for, um, asking for them to pay, essentially pay, since they haven't found anything, to pay his legal fees because his legal fees over a 10-year period um, have essentially bankrupted him. Um, it destroys his family, um, and it also, in a lot of ways, one of the interesting stories of Sam Pierce is the ways in which he has been written out of history. So he's been written out of his uh, civil rights history, he's been written out of political history, he's been even written out of Republican history. So in 1989, as he's leaving, he's being hailed as a hero. Every conservative, you know, outlet, the, the president, the vice president, they're all saying, you know, here's a, here's a guy, the only person in the administration who actually stuck, stuck it to him. Um, civil rights advocates, even civil rights advocates, even as they are very angry at Sam Pierce, also celebrate him because they're like, look, he was working in a bad situation, and he still got these things done. Two months later, you know, as the corruption scandal breaks, everyone abandons him. Right. Even his family. His, his family's papers are here at Harvard, at the Harvard Medical School, and all traces of him has, have essentially been removed. Is he dead? He's dead. He dies in 2000, and uh, the, the Justice Department and, and private correspondence, um, but also his, uh, his lawyer at the time, say that essentially the stress from the trial killed him. This is fantastic. I'm, I'm, I'm no surprise, but it's really, really interesting to talk. Um, so I, I'm not quite sure I have a question. I'm going to make an observation, put a question mark into it, and see whether you can. Uh, the logic of most people's work, to some degree yours, but you're also pushing against it, is that of course African Americans are on the left. Mm -hmm. Any white thinking person is on the left, right? Everybody in this room is on the left. And, and so therefore, what needs to be explained is why blacks would work in the Reagan administration, or why Kimmy Gray would be willing to cooperate, or why, you know, something like. I, how would the, the research be different if, you, if one didn't start from that assumption? If one started, say, from the assumption that, of course, African Americans are capitalists just like white folk are, or there's no ideological assumption. It, it, so, I mean, it, it, 
uh, all of our work, certainly my own, and I think to some degree many people here, it's sort of, you know, we start from an assumption about what's, what's a sort of the obvious starting point, and then, we, then that determines what we think needs to be explained. So I'm just wondering how one would think about your project if you started, it, in effect, from the opposite starting point or from sort of no starting point of assumption. Uh, could I uh, 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 build on Jennifer's question, just to rephrase it uh, slightly differently? Um, you know, what motivated you to uh, do this interesting research? Uh, in other words, uh, what factors generated the research questions you pursued? Was there another question too? I thought I heard someone pipe up. Well, me. Yeah. And also, uh, your book is going to be a bestseller. Uh, <laughs> have you thought, thought about a title yet? <laughs> okay. Why do we think the important intellectual question is how is it possible for somebody to black person to be a Republican? If well, one starts from a conservative perspective or a totally neutral ideological perspective, if there is such a thing, maybe the right question is why would a black person ever work for a Democratic administration? Well, wait a minute. But you have to ask that we were all Republicans at the beginning. Well, yeah. Right. So the last I don't know, 30 or 40 years. Oh, okay. All right. Leah, then okay. Cornell. So there, uh, um, I'm going to try and um, combine part of these questions. So I think that's a fabulous question. Why not start from the point of all black people are capitalists? Um, which in some respects is true, even though black people are the most liberal of the capitalists. Um, and so in fact, when, as I was doing research for my first book, that's what flipped my assumption. So I had gone in exactly with this question, you know, the guiding research question being, you know, why are black people, you know, Republicans? And then why are, you know, do they even exist? And why do they continue to be Republicans after this point? And everybody's saying, well, you're not gonna find anything, so go large. But in fact, if you flip it, and you start from this assumption that, you know, the, this is a principle, this is actually a mainstream principle within black political ideologies, then the narrative starts to look different, and you get to see all of these connections that you wouldn't see if you attack it from a lens that is solely focused on partisan affiliation. So, you know, in my courses, I call it strange bedfellows. Um, but they're actually not so strange when you look at what these people believe and what they do. And, and so, you know, a contemporary example of this is as we look at the disconnect between black people on the ground who say, you know, a, a, large portion of them, I think more than half, support charter schools and you know, housing vouchers and educational vouchers, as opposed to you know, what the policy issue says, suggests that you know, about, because they are Democrats, that they in fact should reject it. And so trying to make sense of that, that nuance there is to me what is the most exciting part. Now one of the challenges though in trying to do that is that the language of this scholarship and of the canon, the existing scholarship, just doesn't exist for something like that. And you know, it's, it's slightly easier to do with this project. With the first project, it was like pulling out teeth to try and get people to see beyond, you know, this is what partisanship means, this is what partisanship means. In fact, it's not even really until the, the very recent contemporary period that people start examining what is underneath not only black democratic you know, affiliation, but black independent, you know, affiliation and black Republican affiliation, or why black people are more willing to split the ticket on a state and local level as opposed to on a national level. So these are some of the ideas that I was, you know, the guiding principle. But I highly recommend for everyone, you know, push back against your assumptions or what, what, the, what the scholarship is telling you, you should, the way that we should be thinking about uh, things as opposed to, you know, the inverse. Um, I think one of the, so, you know, um, Bill, to your, your question about, you know, what were some of the motivating research questions for this? Um, I started from, you know, I started saying, okay, Samuel Pierce is someone who I find incredibly interesting. I talk about him very briefly in my first book uh, with regard to Freedom National Bank. Um, and, you know, to see somebody who's so accomplished, see him pop up when it comes to, near, you know, one of the largest uh, uh, court cases you know, particularly around the, um, the First Amendment with New York Times v. Sullivan, um, 
why can't I find anything on him in the president? In fact, I wrote uh, you know, for the Af Oxford African American uh, History Encyclopedia, I wrote Samuel Pierce's entry. Um, this is years ago, about a decade ago. And so I placed him to the side because I said, okay, there's, there's nothing really here. He was just a dupe or you know, somebody who disappeared and when I look him up, everyone you know, in the brief sentence that they mention him in, uh, it's this guy was really con corrupt and the Mr. Mayor story. But then as I started thinking about kind of larger projects and I'm really interested, was really interested in the 1980s, really interested in a number of you know, uh, black Democrats who go to work in the Reagan administration, black, you know, black Republicans and how they're transforming during this period, Pierce's name continued to pop up. And so I said, okay, there's gotta be more to this story than simply just, he was a dupe, he was a fool. Um, and then I started asking, why is it that we aren't talking about the HUD scandal, considering that four to eight billion dollars goes into, you know, basically contractors' pockets? I mean, and then finding out that more than half of the people involved are black men. You know, Du Bois Gilliam at one point gets a payoff, what he calls a golden parachute, uh, for, that's worth about approximately a million dollars worth of rent subsidies for Section 8 housing as, you know, as a reward for being a loyal Republican and for going quietly into the night. And, and the reason why he's going quietly into the night is because he's being indicted. So there were all of these, you know, these stories. And then what I think put the, you know, the final nail in the, the casket is last October, the two days before Paul Manafort was indicted, I came across all of these files talking about Paul Manafort's involvement in the HUD crisis, how he has a black business partner, they're both from Connecticut, um, and that he has also gotten in lots of other trouble in other areas, right? The DEA says that what he's doing with his lobbying group amounts to the cynical selling of US government secrets to foreign agencies. So that was like, there's a story here. And then out of that, um, came these grassroots activists who both resisted, you know, somebody like Dorothy King or these women who were sitting, you know, suing, but then also the larger, and I'll, if I can figure out what I did with my clicker, I'll show you guys, this other story that didn't fit anywhere into the narrative of these black women in these tenants' rights organizations who have this very close and intimate connection, these poor black women who have this intimate connection with Republican administrations, even as they are stalwart Democrats. So I talked about Kimmy Gray, but another one who some of you may know of because you know, she's on the Oprah show a lot. Um, John Singleton makes a movie, a TV movie about her on, for NBC in 1993. It's Birthday Gilkey, she dies in 2014. Um, but right up there, that's a picture of her giving um, George H.W. Bush a tour of her housing project. And so she, very eagerly, you know, works with these Republican administrations, and she's, she's a favorite of Jack Kemp, who's an interesting figure. But when I would look them up, you know, in the scholarly record, there's very little actual discussion or an analysis of the work that they are doing. No, I want to thank you for this marvelous presentation. I mean, I read from your presentation that greed is just ideologically promiscuous. <laughs> uh, just lie with any group, any, any body, any sexual orientation, any, I got leftist comrades in Brazil who are greedy to the core and they're corrupt. Uh, we could talk about Sharpton, a Jesse, a whole host of folk. They got corrupt elements to them, even though I love those Negroes. Uh, now you're talking about my alpha brother, Samuel Pierce. Mm -hmm. Wrong as he can be. But he had another scandal that he did avert, which was that with his corporate firm, Battle Fowler. Yes. He's the first black partner on Wall Street. He is providing all kinds of resources to them under the table. He denies that he's lying. Many of them go to jail, he doesn't. Already you get the formation of black professionals, no matter what their narrow, neoliberal, neoconservative, intimate relations to big money, big capital, and provide resources. You, see, you can say this exact same thing to Eric Holder, his relation to Covington and Weiss, and why they didn't 
why they didn't try to prosecute, didn't, didn't appoint one person in the whole Justice Department to even have an investigation of his friends he's playing, playing golf with, you see. And that's tied to Obama. Well, that's another issue. We won't get into that. But you, you gestured at the end of the black neoliberals' formation and their relation to big money, big capital. Now, there's a difference, though, for me between corruption and greed versus indifference to the vulnerable. Yes. You see, they're, they're not the same thing. You can have persons who are not corrupt, who are not greedy, but still make as a priority relation to power and wealth, like, 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 like Clarence, like Clarence Thomas. He makes a priority to power and wealth, but he's not a greedy person, and he doesn't seem to be corrupt. He's just wrong 98% of the time. That's, it's a different thing. So the question becomes, how do you make these kind of distinctions in relation to a black professional class so we can most importantly be principled in our accountability rather than just demonize them or, 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 or somehow marginalize them. They're human beings, they're subject to greed and corruption like anybody else. How do you make sure they're answerable, as it were? And then, of course, you, it applies across the board because you got you know, greed. I'm, I'm saying a whole lot of things in an un, 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 unclear way, but, but I think it's important. all of his friends and class peers. Right, who are still alive. <laughs> who are still alive. But Vernon's alive, Ken Chanel's alive. All those guys are the black power elite. They all know each other. Dick Parsons alive, though he's sick. But you know, it, as long as they thought that you weren't doing a hatchet job, which you're not, that you're trying to tell the story, they will talk to you in amazing detail, I, I, I would think. Because it's all tied to the rise of affirmative action, our generation, the, where'd he go to school? He's Phi Beta Kappa at Cornell, mm -hmm. Yale Law School, just like us. And it's the rise of this age group. I mean, he's older than, I'm 68, we're about the same age. How old was, when was Pierce born? Pierce was born in, who, 30 something? Oh yeah, well see, that's a, that's. Yeah. Oh wow, well yeah, that's Late a whole 20, nother okay. thing. <laughs> okay, 1927. Oh yeah, well okay, well there. They're the, the old Negroes. But, <laughs> but they're legacies, and this is tied to Jennifer's point. Why would all black people be anything? There are 42 million black people as a country. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have left-wing black people, middle black people, right-wing black people, and a lot of times the most important thing about you is the fact that you're black. And your friends are your friends who happen to be black, whether they are on the right or the left. That these, you know, who's in the boule, who's in the alphas, who went to Harvard, who went to Howard. Mm -hmm. These things cut across what would appear to be from the outside um, differences that would divide. Publicly, they might divide, but it's like uh, William F. Buckley's best friend was Al Lowenstein. Yeah. William, you all don't even know what Al Lowenstein is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they played, uh, they went to Yale together, they played tennis together. And if they were on firing line, you'd think they hated each other. Class trumps everything. Anyway, um, <laughs> Elizabeth. Thank you so much for this presentation, Lee. I absolutely loved it. I am so excited for this book. <laughs> Very happy that you're doing the 80s and tackling the beast that is the Reagan administration. And I guess, um, maybe not surprisingly, that's where my question is really located. So I'm wondering if we can kind of put this case and these officials in the context of the Reagan administration more broadly mm -hmm. and maybe corruption within the Reagan administration. So how much of what we saw in HUD was a reflection of kind of other practices within the Reagan administration? I mean, of course, I'm thinking about Iran-Contra. Iran mm -hmm. So how is, you know, how is this also about a kind of culture um, that may, that's existing within that administration, maybe within the Republican Party during this period that might involve all of the elements that Dr. West is talking about, corruption, greed, and indifference um, to the poor at the highest level. So I'd just love to hear you talk about that. And maybe also, I'm, you know, I was thinking a lot about Noah Robinson's uh, prosecution, Jesse Jackson's brother during this time, who was um, tried and, and convicted of um, white collar crime and corruption charges and involvement in, with gangs in Chicago. So just thinking about this moment too, it, you know, when we're beginning to see, and I think that this is one of the kind of most understudied um, 
aspects of uh, the kind of rising literature on the carceral state and uh, racial disparities in the justice system, but the ways in which right, white collar criminal prosecutions are also disproportionately fall on African Americans. So yes. love to hear you also talk about that that's also beginning to take off during this period if you have anything to say. And then finally, I'll tell you just so much to think about um, with this work, but I'd love to hear if you have any thoughts. I know you're still kind of in earlier stages of this project, but to think about what some of the lasting legacies for HUD might have been um, going into the 90s, going into the Clinton administration where we see a new kind of level of draconian targeted anti-welfare um, policies and you know what the implications might be for now we have um, Ben Carson as the uh, secretary of HUD. So yeah, that's well, I'll, I'll a tell lot. You one thing. <laughs> so thank you. I'll, I'll tell you one thing, you know, um, some of you may have heard the sto story, but when Ben Carson, when it was announced Ben Carson was gonna be HUD secretary, one of his good friends wrote him a memo called Don't Be Sam Pierce. So I've been trying to get my hands on a copy of this memo because it was, it was then distributed to you know, all of the policy making, all the people in policy making roles in HUD, including several of whom were black, but who also later got fired for being critical of the administration. So they're booted out and they're replaced with other people. And in fact, you see a lot of parallels in the ways that, you know, the indicators of the red flags of corruptions that are very much, you know, Sam Pierce is involved in a, in a minor furniture scandal in the first couple of years of his administration. Like you know, Carson. like, like yeah, like, so like Dr. Carson. Um, and there are all kinds of things. One of the, you know, one of the things that the independent prosecutor found in the, the overarching uh, investigation is that a culture of political nepotism, essentially appointing, you know, replacing career employees with experience um, and knowledge with people who had just basically, you know, like run campaigns and done political favors who were in their 20s, um, had actually contributed to this notion of corruption because you put these people in positions of power and all of a sudden they're gonna run wild and they're gonna reward their friends and they're gonna punish their enemies. And so we see a little bit of this, you know, uh, Carson has essentially gotten into a little bit of hot water for appointing family members to HUD positions or allowing them to use HUD funding. You cannot do that. Um, and so there are all of these red flags um, you know, people talk a lot about, well, you know, maybe it's ignorance or, you know, maybe it's just not knowledge of how the government works. And yes, that's true, but it's also deliberate. So when people realize that there is no oversight and that nobody really cares, that, you know, they run wild. Um, so I do think that there's, you know, there are implications. You know, one clear difference between Carson um, and, uh, and uh, Pierce is that Pierce genuinely cared about fair housing and civil rights. Um, the historical record is not mistaken about that. I mean, it's very, very clear. He butts heads with um, Ronald Reagan. He butts heads with the Office of um, Budget and Management. You know, as they're slashing things, uh, he fights with Ed Meese over affirmative action um, issues. Um, and so he gets a reputation as being, you know, uh, in complete discord with the administration on civil rights. Um, I don't see Ben Carson as being in discord with anything uh, with the current administration. Um, so I would say, you know, later on with a couple of things, be on the lookout for how funds are being used or misused. Um, and there's the same level of disinterest in housing, public disinterest in housing that existed in the 1980s. Um, yeah, so I'll stop, I'll, I'll stop there for that. Um, I'm gonna try and come back to some of these questions. I'm gonna come back to the question about white commoner criminals and kind of disproportionately coming down on uh, black people. So just to, you know, let me see if I can go, go back a couple slides. Um, when we look at all the people who are prosecute, prosecuted, a couple of things, a lot of them have their prosecutions overturned, um, but some of them never do, you know, never do a day of jail time. Like, Deborah Gordine, if you're out there watching, hello, call me. Um, but is an, is an antique dealer in um, Washington D.C. and you know uh, her attorneys appealed her conviction. I think for for 12 years, and eventually she she did no time whatsoever. Um, some of these in some of these cases, you know, they they were unjust. Ed Brooks' secretary is convicted, and she shouldn't have been convicted. Um, I think she is a white woman, um, but she's. I mean. 
the prosecutors are very clear in their, you know, in their analysis. They're like, ah, she didn't do anything wrong, but, you know, we need to tag her with this. And we're going to, you know, we're going to sit her down and say, like, you, should, you, you need to agree to a plea, plea deal. It's only just going to be a slap on the wrist. Um, I believe um, James Watts, uh, James Watt doesn't do any jail time. Um, interestingly enough, the ones who, uh, Du Bois Gilliam does 18 months. But in exchange for um, not receiving further jail time, he receives immunity for testifying against all the rest of these people. One of the things that he, um, one of the things that, and just one other thing to point out, you know, there's a there's a radical kind of or stark contrast in the case of Victor Cruz, who's still alive, lives in Connecticut, and Paul Manafort and their fates. I mean, this is his business partner. They are involved in the exact same thing. And they know it. I mean, if you get a chance, watch this. I mean, it's C-SPAN, but watch, the, watch, the, watch Manafort's testimony. It is, I mean, it is skillful. Because he comes right out and says, yes, I did engage in influence peddling. The problem is not me. It's you. You have a broken system. I just took advantage of it. And somehow Victor Cruz is not so fortunate in, or, or skillful. I don't know which one it is, but ends up getting hit with multiple counts. Uh, including, um, you know, I think threatening gratuity, illegal gratuities, um, bribery, all of these charges. They're later, you, they're later overturned, but it's a multi-year process. It takes a long time. It takes a long, it takes a lot out of him. Um, one of the remarkable things I think, though, about this, though, uh, about the the HUD prosecution, is how long this dragged out. I think it was finally settled in 1998. So it cost somewhere in the middle, cost taxpayers somewhere in the area of like $300 million. I mean, Clinton is exiting the White House as the independent investigators are wrapping up. Um, one more thing that I'll say that I haven't quite figured out how to do, although I think maybe it connects to uh, Cornell's point about these, these nuances between different types of, of people. Du Bois Gilliam talks a lot about how he felt powerful as a black man in HUD, a young black man who, in his own words, was not qualified to be there because the career um, in uh, uh, basically control, so investigators like the solicitor general, um, uh, inspector general, who basically patrols HUD to make sure no corruption or bad things are happening, was white. And so when he would investigate, when he would say, ah, oh, some things look a little sticky here, Gilliam and, uh, and, and others, not peers, but really Gilliam, Lance Wilson, and a few others would say, well, you're just investigating us because we're black. And so it's a very deliberate strategy to use the race. And they said the investigator would back off. He'd say, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Did, you know what? Fine. Later on, what we see, not in Gilliam's case, but in Lance Wilson's case and Leonard Briscoe's case, because Briscoe and Wilson have a company together, um, we also see that it, there's this explosive, there's explosive moments in the trial, because when the trial starts, the prosecutor is white. And so Wilson says, you know, you're targeting me because I'm black. You're, you know, why aren't you targeting these white boys out here? And it continues to be this back and forth. That is the line of argument to the point where the prosecutor steps down and is replaced by a black prosecutor. So they make it a trial that is about race and racism and discrimination. And they may, in some respects, be right <laughs> that they are being targeted or, you know, in a way, there's a, lo a level of attention being paid to them because they're black. But they also know that they can use that to their advantage. And so what ends up happening, I'll, I'll stop here, is it's really up to the career, the black career employees to call this out, where they're like, you can't play, you can't, sorry to say this, you can't play the race card. You're actually being racist. You're being discriminatory. And so you know, what they end up seeing happening is many of them get furloughed, many, many of them get transferred, many of them get fired when they begin to call it out. I'll stop there, because I think we're out of time. time. Oh. Oh, OK. We got time for one last very oh, okay. quick question. Yeah. Oh, my, my question, sort of comment, doubt. One, with the Gilkey lady, I'd like to talk to mm -hmm. you about her uh, later. But um, I think we were all sort of, uh, you guys were working around the idea of the, the, that black folks are very pragmatic, right? So, very what? Pra pragmatic, pragmatic, right? So, especially with the um, 
I, th I thought that you were really strong in terms of talking about how the parents would give this advice of how to work systems and of working in, you know, how, how do we start to draw lines between them and what they're doing in the politics and what we are doing and how we work systems within academia and working this out? So, <laughs> so, so, not, not necessarily, but that was the point I was making about why well, I said that I thought that this transcended the idea of partisanship because how do we think about behaviors, particularly, you know, to Skip's point, about a particularly privileged class of black folks, right, who are operating in these worlds that were never meant for them. So colleges and universities, corporate boards, right, you know, uh, uh, pr the private sector. And then what are the trade-offs that people make in their day-to-day -day experiences, particularly in the short term. Right? So a lot, you'll hear a lot, even amongst, you know, in a room full of, of lefties, right? Shoot, I've he heard this in a room full of Marxists, right? They'll say, I believe in these things, but man, I need to eat, and, you know, I really like nice things. So a lot of folks have a complicated relationship <laughs> with, uh, with many of these, with many of these trade-offs. And I think part of, what, part of the work that I'm interested in doing is really blurring the lines, um, these hard lines, and calling into question, bringing up these big questions about how people move and why they make the decisions that they do in these spaces. Thank you. 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 Thank you.